times, four times there. Yeah. And I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do all these years <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of funny, right? It's like we're, we're, we've grown up and yet I'm like, I ain't done yet. I mean, I, cause I, I, I mean, look at us now. I mean, who would have thought that in our fifties we would be yeah. doing what we're doing? And and I'm obviously I'm referring to the podcast. And yeah. well, hell, I mean, it's only been what three months where we've really been doing the show together. Yeah, and it's it's really kind of it's it's grown substantially. Now it's obviously still very much in its infancy, but yeah. it's grown substantially to the <clears throat> point where I, you know, if we keep this up, we'll be, you know, we should see the snowball going over the course of, uh, yeah. of 2024. Obviously, obviously the technology has, has enabled uh, people like us to be able to do these kinds of things. But here we are talking about the things that matter to us in hopes that it'll matter to other people. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and that'll build a little bit of a groundswell. And next thing you know, we got more and more stuff that we're able to highlight about where we grew up. You know, I, I certainly wouldn't have imagined it just, there's no way. <laughs> it's kind of, oh, yeah. You know, you and I really haven't been in each other's lives all that much at all. And then all of a sudden right. it's like, bam, you know, and yeah, I mean, if you look back on 2023 and, and where things have evolved for you, what, what things are, what, I mean, what was expected, what was unexpected, what are you happy about? What are you, wish you could do differently. I mean, all those things, you know, this typical, yeah. you know, year in review type thing. Right. Yeah. So, um, what, 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 what are the, some of the highlights and, and interesting data points for you for, for the past year? Well, like you said, I mean, if, if you would have told me a year ago that I'd be doing a podcast with you, I would have thought, okay, yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think, like you said, you and I have touched base over the years on similar topics, just, you know, but it we didn't really realize there was a whole lot of maybe alignment with some of it. And sure. then in the beginning, you know, so, I mean, the last several years, there's been a lot of things that have been kind of evergreen from the standpoint of the stuff that, um, you know, getting um, the uh, Melitol work yep. done because uh I kind of grew into that where, as I've talked about before with my interest in our connecting back to Louisiana and my kids knowing about where we came from mm -hmm. is that, you know, at least in my climate, in my locale, I'm very able, I'm very similarly able to do a lot of what they are able to do in Louisiana from a growing and, and raw material standpoint for the, the foods and such. Right. And so when I kind of discovered, and I always go back that the story for me is I went back to the John Fulce, uh Cajun Creole Encyclopedia, and I started looking through um, recipes and I'd see things for melitons or Creole tomatoes or uh, some of these other vegetables. And I'd go to the local grocery store and you would never find them or you'd find something close. And then I started thinking, well, if I, really want to get these things i would need to learn how to grow them right so i was right. growing some vegetables already but then i kind of focused into louisiana style garden and so that ended up allowing me to to really focus in on the melitol which then turns out that dr hill who had started the group in in new orleans after katrina he had had some health issues and he kind of faded from the scene for a while and so i was doing it and then he got healthy again and then he asked me to help you know kind of be second in command and then so he and i have been doing a lot together to kind of spearhead that right and uh that group you know i think i think he t like tossed around the idea two years ago of having a facebook group and uh but he didn't really ever say anything about the group itself so we, you know mm -hmm. he and i agreed created it and i think we had maybe two thousand that we uh subscribers it may have even been beginning of the year 
And now we're like 3,700 just because people are, especially after the bad summer that we had with heat, people right. are more and more interested in learning to grow it and cook it. So I see that being something to continue to hopefully spread accurate information on how to do that. And it, You um, know, what's, it, what's interesting to me, at least from what you're doing, is yeah. who knew? I mean, seriously, it's like this is um, such such a and this isn't to take away from what you've done, but it's it's such an obscure yeah. topic. I mean, when oh, yeah. people when people talk about niching down, you have yeah. gone down <laughs> as far as you can possibly go with yeah. with talking about Meliton, right? And and yeah. the 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 channel and you know uh, being part of the the various groups that you're part of on Facebook. You've been able to now. It's not happened overnight, of course, but I mean, you've, right. you've been able to to really kind of cement yourself as an as an expert in in something as Nietzsche as as Meliton. And I'm sure you were kind of probably caught off guard a little bit, <laughs> especially. I was looking at your 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 screenshot that you took, and this this was. Now, so this this casserole that you did and you put yeah. on what was it? Uh, what what uh, form was it's that? A, on? Uh, uh, the, that one uh, was on the Melitol page. That okay, I, I put it on two or three pages, but that one that really took off is on this Melitol page. It already had all the people, and I mean, it's all the, like, all look the, at that. Yeah, <laughs> seven hundred sixty nine <laughs> likes or whatever, and one hundred eighty three yeah. shares. That's a picture. Of a dish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no recipe there. There's no nothing. No. <laughs> it's just a picture. No. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I mean, boom, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, that's like I said, that's because I think I've taken, I mean, I did this, I think uh, this was for Christmas Day, and I didn't cook this till or put it together until I think it was either Friday. Yeah. Might have done a Friday. So it was on four days or so now. And I think the first two days, I just, I kind of all of a sudden glanced down and I saw how many times it was shared and I was like, what the heck? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've honestly posted much better looking dishes than, than that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's the part that's like, <laughs> all right, you know, and so all these, all these like, you know, soothsayer marketer types that say, we can help you get this many likes and shares and subscribers. They're full of crap. They're full of crap yeah. because they, they never would have predicted something like this. They would have said, yeah. well, you know, you could probably mess with the tones a little bit, make it a little bit warmer, maybe do a little bit of depth of field, you know, all this crap. Yeah. And <laughs> you didn't do any of that. You just got there with your phone, tink, and, and, you know, it's not even a, it's not even a late model iPhone. It's just your. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's pretty and impressive. I think, yeah. And I think I told you too, it looks like. And I'm assuming that not all of this, but the, the the subscription to the group grew like 263 members in just last week. And so I got to believe that because it was, now I had this marked as um, public. So okay. I think that's part of it. That's and definitely so it got shared. It. And so I'm kind of surprised, like I say, is there's some people that, and I had, they had like five or six asks for the recipe, which I gave. Um, but yeah, like I said, I've been kind of surprised with with that, which, you know, I appreciate that the people like it and they were interested sure. and they want to learn more about it, you know, come on down. And, yeah. and that's, you know, perfectly the same thing we're doing with the Meliton.org is what you and I are trying to do with the podcast and, and Louisiana Foods. Uh, not as it's niched, but not as niched down <laughs> as specifically yeah, to that. It, exactly. <laughs> When I set about to, to make this podcast, it was really, I had one very specific goal in mind and then a bunch of just, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. The The first one being, I had busted my ass for so long. You know, entrepreneurial life is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. And I've had successes and I've had failures. Mm -hmm. And the the brewery was supposed to be kind of our, I don't know, swan song, you know, just that was the last thing that we were going to do before we uh, went into whatever they call retirement these days. Yeah. And um, that imploded 
it, it you know, with, with COVID and um, just the restaurant business in general, but the brewery yeah. business we had nailed. I mean, we just had it nailed. And then the, the, the restaurant business, when you tack that on, it, it is a wholly separate business. And then if you have the bar as part of that, that in and of itself is kind of its own business. And I, I, I have a newfound respect for people who work in that industry, both from management mm-hmm. all the way down to the people who work in the trenches. There's a lot of work that goes into having a pleasant experience when you go to visit these places. Something I yeah. had no idea it, you know, when we had the brewery in a small little spot up here in Bellevue, it was easy, uh, easy-ish. Yeah. And then when we got to the restaurant business, it was just, it was just a grind for for five years. It was a grind. It was t- it took its toll on on everybody, and and um, I'm glad uh, we had that experience because it helped my wife get her job, which has been a godsend for us because it's a, Mm -hmm. it's a good company. It's a stable company, something we really desperately needed after the instability of the restaurant business, the hospitality business. But when I went to go start this podcast, I wanted to do something that was the, the concept was, okay, this is where I'm from. This is my history. This is my family's history. They're, are millions of people that live in Louisiana. There are millions of people that visit Louisiana, and there's got to be some. Uh, there's got to be a few folks, and and what what it's evolved into is not something that I was really fully expecting, right? For mm-hmm. for me personally, I had largely thought about this as a, as a way to introduce people to the various goods that the grocery store had here in town. And, um, and that was an easy one because that was me trying food and trying food with the owner and then talking about it and getting people pumped about it and then sending it off to the social media channels. And there we went. Um, Mm -hmm. of course that takes two to tango and that unfortunately didn't work out the way I had expected it to. So anyway, the, the, the podcast has definitely taken a different turn and I think one for the better, but it also has involved kind of retooling my messaging and then figuring out, okay, how do we make this work on YouTube? And yeah. so obviously once we started talking about food, that got a lot of people interested in it, right? Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, people think that all the Cajun culture has to offer them is cooking, And, you know, it's easy to play into that stereotype, but I I, I know that the podcast can be much more than that. And that's something we'll talk about in a little bit. But when you had the opportunity to, to get on this podcast, what did you feel like when, when, you know, we got on for the first time, we started talking, what, what Mm -hmm. were your, some of your initial impressions as far as being on it? I think it, it, for me, you know, if I go back to, I'm going to say as early as 2005, 2006, mm-hmm. uh, the company I worked with at the time, um, they were undergoing a bunch of stuff. And I kind of didn't really like that direction it was going to go in, which it still ended up going in that direction. But right. it got me interested in learning about other things, other ways to uh, maybe have some type of side incomes or some other type of, you know, that was my initial thing. And But that got me into listening to people who were presenting on uh, this whole new medium of podcasting. Right. And, uh, initially it was blogging for me is what I thought. I was mostly interested in the genealogy aspect at first and, and finding out, wow, there's all these cousins of ours here and on this forum. Right. And so, but then I'd start seeing these older guys who were in their seventies and eighties, they'd start posting these pictures of foods and these dishes. Right. And I mean, you and I aren't, you know, I, I think that there's never been the the mindset that uh, cooking is just woman's work, especially when you come from South Louisiana. Oh, no, um, not at all. Or even... Dude, get in there and make you some prolines. It's like a hurt your manhood. You know, even South Alabama, I will give credit, there's a very healthy um, male 
dominated cooking experience or that, you know, the expectation when it's not just the grilling and the, and the smoking of meats and stuff, but there's other things, a lot of guys in the control rooms and stuff. And a lot of people, a lot of males take pride in that. So to see these older guys sharing these things, and some of them are things I had never heard of because like I've shared some of these recipes or things with you, they just not, they are just not that popular because you don't see them on the uh, food network or you don't right. see them on uh, the, the typical food magazines. So that got me interested in the, that aspect. And so I started thinking, well, maybe I can take some of that and go into blogging. And I tried that for a bit, but I mean, I like to write and, and read, but that's a very tedious thing to keep up with all the sure. time. And so, and then I guess that eventually led to where I was kind of playing around with some YouTube stuff. And I, and I found that I kind of like the medium of video and even doing some editing stuff to either do some short videos or actually I've done some longer ones that I think the problem with those is they had too much information in them. There's like, there's three 30 to 40 minute ones I did on these the history of a certain dish that I found out in that region. And I enjoyed doing it and learning it, but to put that together and to research it and it's, you know, a lot of them I think have gotten over a thousand views, but it was just not much of an audience standpoint. So earlier this year, I uh, decided that I think I had been up to, what was it, like six or 700? I, I know I didn't, no, I think two years ago I surpassed 500 view uh, subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. So I started kind of getting interested in that. But then earlier this year, uh, or for the last five years through Meliton.org, I started putting together weekly videos during the season just to show people what your Meliton vine should be looking like week to week, what you can expect. And, and those were fairly good. I could do like a 13 week series and I do a few recipes once in a while, but then I ended up this past summer deciding that all those vegetables we were, I was telling you about earlier, since I've got so many, I say unique or different varieties, I said, I just, I did something I called uh, growing some Louisiana history. And mm -hmm. I, it was just, the intention was to be about a 10 minute little, here's a little history on the seeds you know, where they came from, who grew them and right. how they're doing in my garden. And, and that kind of got me into trying to do something on a more scheduled, once again, scheduled type thing. So when you, you know, asked about me participating in it, I just saw that as a good progression to kind of help do some of the things I'd already been working toward because I mean, yeah, you know, I, I like podcasts. I like to listen to them and watch them. And to me, there's a lot of opportunity to to do it. But I didn't have all the technical know-how of, and maybe even the technical patience to uh, to put it to put it <laughs> together. And so, you know, I thought that maybe that uh, you know I can help you out by providing either some of the stuff that uh, either you couldn't find, or maybe some histories or some backgrounds right. or some. You know, I have an opportunity. I've made some connections over the years too that have helped me learn. And so I figured, you know, us combining forces would be a good thing to help share that with others who are interested or a few years behind us and their, their interest in learning about our shared history. Definitely. I mean, it, there's, it, it's, I don't know, maybe it was just good timing, you know, the, you, your interest level in podcasting and your interest level in uh, the, the genealogy, the history of the family and obviously, of course, getting more and more into the 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 food component of of Southern life, Southern living. I think that coupled with you know me kind of sliding into this thing and and figuring out, okay, well, how do we bring this to the masses? And uh, I do feel like, at least from my perspective, I feel like you give the the podcast street cred i mean you I, you I, and and you know I, that's that's neither one of us talk like we're from lafayette yeah right <laughs> yeah exactly not, not one of us and yeah. if anything i have been severely sanitized and reprogrammed to sound like i'm from the west coast and i try really hard to get out of that but then i i then i'm like 
am I an imposter? You know, there's at least you have some kind of accent. I do not. I mean, maybe I do. and Maybe it sounds like I'm from the West Coast, like totally, dude. But, you know, it's <laughs> it's I still say you guys and I have to smack myself. And it's like I can't you know, I can't do that anyway. I, the, uh, the, I, I, go ahead. No, I just I feel like part of you, you look at some of the other personalities that are mm -hmm. uh, representing Louisiana on social media, particularly yeah. YouTube. They're very interesting characters. Yeah. And <laughs> um and they all I, I my my uh my favorite is Jordan and and not because he's legit. You know, he's yeah. he's legit and his <clears throat> His humor is world class dad humor. Yeah. You know, he's really good at it. And and him I can I can see. And you know, and he, he does his little excursions and things like that uh yeah. out into the swamps to catch frogs and like that. Right. Yeah. And he he seems legitimate to me, you know, and, and I think he is. I mean, he he speaks uh, French Canadian, uh, you know. He's definitely uh, he's the real deal. Uh, but some of the other characters, I think, tend to be a little bit more of perpetuating a stereotype about Louisiana that I'm not thrilled about in terms yeah. of just not sounding very educated. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And and there's a lot of smart people leave, live in Louisiana. I think you develop a, res, uh, a certain uh, reverence or respect for the things that Louisiana offers to the world when you leave Louisiana and you see the lack of things that you're used to seeing in in louisiana yeah. you know there's the, it's really hard to explain for people who've never been there and louisiana is not just new orleans it's not right. just mardi gras it's not just bourbon street there's so much more to it even within new orleans if you were to take mardi gras out of it the city can stand on its own i mean it the 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 culture the history the the diversity and and yeah. it's never been a forced. I mean, okay, well, we could say that the the slave trade was a forced diversity, but I don't think it was looked at it that way back then. I, it, no, but no. nowadays, you know, everybody's trying to be you know culturally sensitive and blah 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 blah. And at the same time, I'm kind of going. They never really needed to do that back home. They they really yeah. didn't. It just, people just kind of assimilated, and there's a, it's not like New Orleans. It's unique to New Orleans, obviously. You have the Italian community, the Irish community, all those the immigrants that came over uh, mm -hmm. in the early 1900s, late 1800s. I don't think there's been one city in the United States that's had so many different cultures come together in such a small footprint. I mean. Compared to Manhattan, which is, I would say, is probably one of the more diverse cities in the United States, New Orleans is, it doesn't have that same vibe. You know, it's not, it's not, people come together in New York because they're all looking to make a name. They're all looking to make some money and, yeah, you know, utilize the resources that the city has to offer. New Orleans is still very much, I mean, it's been this way our entire lives. It, it is a laid back city. I don't ever see it being a city that the rest of the country will look to for inspiration in terms of uh, progress. If yeah. anything, Louisiana tries to hold on to the past and New Orleans definitely tries to hold on to the past as much as possible, which is great. I think it's great because mm -hmm. what people are starting to do nowadays um, is they're forgetting the past and they're repeating it. And I see that even in my short lifetime, I'm seeing it happen within my own lifetime of people doing things. It's like, dude, we already tried this. It didn't work. What, what, yeah. <laughs> what's going on? You know? Um, yeah. I think so every 30 years or so you start seeing some of the same stuff re rehashing or coming up and it's like, you know, 
Yeah. Uh, there was younger, younger folks at work used to make a comment. Uh, oh, we've never seen this before. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we've seen this before, before my time. You know, just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it did, it's it's never happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, I went way off there. Um, <laughs> you were going to say something and then I, I actually was going to make a short point and then it ended up being a long point. Do you recall what you were going to say? No, but I think that, you know, a lot of the things that we we have the the desire to to achieve through through the podcast, um, you know, we 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 come from you know, even though we started from the same family and we branched out and had different experiences, um, like you said, you know, I haven't traveled as far away from ground zero being Metairie, if you want to call it, or Saint James Parish. Right than as you have, but yet those same things that we, that are, you know, I mean, I grew up away with my parents. You grew up after you had been, I mean, after your parents, you know, you were an adult basically when you moved away. And so their, their experiences moving away is probably a lot like what you had. You know, I think they, or I'll say my dad perhaps was maybe, you just made the assumption you were always going to have these type of things available to you. Right. And, um, and in his case and her and my mom's case, you know, they didn't realize till, you know, they went to Houston first and Dallas is that, Oh my gosh, you know, you can't get the fresh seafood, you know, things that you were used to getting. Yeah. And, 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 or like you said, even the cultures of new Orleans being a, a port city all since its inception, yeah, has um, I think that helps with that acceptance and that diversity that has come through the the city. Yep, that you know people have always been of the, the uh, say always they seem to have always been of the mindset. Um, you know whether it's food or certain cultural or religious practices that if it's something that <laughs> especially if it's something that's enjoyable, you know they're going to take that in as part of their um their whole, you know, so, uh, you know, if this was good in that gumbo, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to add it to mine. And so there's a willingness to try and accept it. Right. And, and I think that helps develop the culture that we have uh, grown to appreciate and other places in the United States where even though we, New Orleans see, and Louisiana want to seem to hold on to that. I think that when you have a place where you haven't had a whole lot of influx and um, opportunity for diversity, then I think those people are even more at a, I'll say, disadvantage because I think there's that reluctance to to change. I mean, the, our reluctance to change is maybe more of the appreciation of, uh, you know, with Christmas just passing this or being this past week. You know, I think back of the, the few, you know, we get together, grandma and grandpa's at my other grandparents' house, yep. being in New Orleans at Christmas time. There are certain foods, there are certain songs, there are certain things that I want to re-experience because I enjoyed them when I was younger. Sure. And and I think that's sort of maybe the same sort of thing that people in, in New Orleans and Louisiana want to have is the good things and the things they enjoy. They want to be able to hold on to that enough to pass it on to their family. Right. And, um, and so maybe other people are like that in, in the, uh, throughout other parts of the world, country, but I, I don't know whether they just don't have the strong either familial ties or the strong cultural ties to to want to preserve it. And um, it's not that we want to make every place New Orleans or Louisiana. No, no. I mean, Mobile's got its unique its uniqueness. Um, Seattle, I guess, has got its uniqueness. Uh, yes, you want to share, sure, um, with well, what you had. Well, that that's that's exactly it. That's the whole reason for this podcast. It's for it's for sharing because because I'm tired of the stereotypes. I'm I'm tired yeah. of the the mischaracterization of people who are from Louisiana. And it's not meant as a defensive thing, but I think it's an it's a moment for educating people yeah. about what it's like to live in Louisiana, what it's like to have a family there, start a family, raise a family, live, mm-hmm. die there, all those things. That it, it is um it, it's something that if 
I, the way I look at it is, is that if we have a way to give the state a voice mm-hmm. and, and specifically to our experiences, you know, the river parishes, the suburbs yeah. of New Orleans, North Shore, then, you know, th- at least that's something, right? Yeah. I can't speak to Shreveport <clears throat> or West Monroe. We can lend our personal experiences to and hope give people a yeah. a better perspective on what it's like. And why is yeah. it called the Sportsman's Paradise? I mean, I... I love like the the, the se- segments that I see from Bayou Wild. I think are great. Oh, They're yeah. great ways to expose people to um, the 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 sportsman aspect and some of the cultural aspects of South mm-hmm. Louisiana. I I think what we can do is something that's a bit more. Not more. I think it's a it would be complementary to what they're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. we 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 can do it on a weekly basis where they're they're releasing on a weekly basis, but like you said, the, they're filming in chunks, and and I, I just feel like uh, we can tie our podcast releases with major events. Uh, obviously, we've got mm-hmm. Mardi Gras coming up, yeah. and Mardi Gras is. I, I was thinking about that, you know, what we're gonna do for that, and so Mardi Gras. <laughs> It already starts early with Rex, right? Yeah. Rex is, I think Rex rolls at 10. I think it's 10, but oh no, I'm sorry. It starts with Zulu. And Zulu, I think, is like seven or eight in the morning. And wow. then, yeah. And then there's Rex. <clears throat> and then I don't know if there's anything else after that besides the truck floats. I'd have to look at the schedule. Every, you know, the, with with all the, the changes in the city that, there's some parades that are no longer oh, yeah. around. There's yeah. new ones in and everything. Of course, we got Endymion, we got Bacchus, um, the big ones. Mm-hmm. And I, and I'm trying to think about, all right, how do we expose people to this? But you know, in both an educational way, and yeah. and and you know, recognizing that yes, it is as fun as it appears to be, and yes, it can get out of control. And and mm-hmm. you know, this is probably something that you'll experience. Once in your life, and then that's it. You're good. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, just speaking as somebody from native New Orleans, a native New Orleanian, I went, I, you, did you go when we were, when Mama lived on Bonneville, did you go out to the truck parades along Veterans? And it is one February. My parents decided that they were going to take us out of school early. And we went to New Orleans and we went to grandma and grandpa's and we walked down to veterans and it was a night parade. I couldn't even tell you which parade it was. I mean, I probably could go back and do some searching and figure it out. We did that one time and stood at the, the, basically the intersection of Bonneville and, and veterans okay. and, and watched the parade. And that was the one that we really did. And, um, other than coming to, to Mobile and Mobile's parades, which is a whole other, <laughs> whole other thing. <laughs> They've gotten met, which they have gotten better from an inter, uh, as far as a co- uh, comparison, yeah. To what you get in Louisiana, um, but uh, that was the only one I can really remember. Is that one time? Okay, so you have not partaken in Mardi Gras in the quarter ever? No, no. Uh, I have no desire to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'll give you a quick backstory here. I when I had got, finally gotten into technology and and was working as a reseller for Autodesk in New Orleans. What I I had some I had the my sales rep who was based in San Francisco and her friend who I'm still friends with now they came down for Mardi Gras. And so me, my boss, and these two young single women, we all went out to the French Quarter, and he had a house. God, I forget which street it was on, uh, but it it was in the Garden District. He had a okay. – and, and so we had a, a base camp, as it were, 
we did the we did the full on walk down St. Charles, end up in the quarter. Lots of things wow. that I saw that I was not expecting to see. I, I think I was 18 or 9. No, I had to have been about 19 at the time. So it took me 19 years, 19 years yeah. to get to the French Quarter, right? And I, thank yeah. God, because I, I mean, as a kid, no, 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 no. Yeah. That is not yeah. the place you want to take your children. You can go up to Lee Circle. Is it still called Lee Circle? I can't remember if they uh, call change it to whatever Alan Toussaint or something. Yeah, yeah whatever. But uh, Alan Toussaint was a customer of mine, believe it or not. Really? Uh, yeah, <laughs> a long time ago. But uh, you know, from uh, along St. Charles, that's fine, right? Along yeah. St. Charles, that's the 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 parades are fine. But once you get into the CBD and then the quarter, yeah. Man, just get out. <laughs> just get out. Especially with family. Just just get out. Yeah. Because all that's left really is tourists. And it's not I mean, it's not meant to be a bad thing. I look, if you yeah. guys want to go and spend your money at Mardi Gras, trust me, the city of New Orleans can use the <laughs> influx of cash. Now what they yeah. choose to do with it is entirely out of the citizens' control, which kind of sucks. Yeah. And this has always been this has been the history of the city. Yeah, I, I I think with the with we have we have a really interesting opportunity, for instance, with Mardi Gras mm -hmm. to be able to do some some great educational things, of course. Well, and, and to your point there is that um <clears throat> just in the subject of Mardi Gras in general, is the fact that there is so many layers to it and people see the parades and the flashing to get the beads and, and, right. and the the other debaucheries that they take <laughs> as being part of the Mardi Gras experience. Right. Um, you know, and there's the, there's the religious aspect of the whole thing to begin with that, you know, oftentimes gets overlooked. Right. There's the, the cruise and the, the histories of the cruise, as you've already talked about some of the names and their inceptions and what they were, trying to achieve and and then and then the, even the the groups themselves all have certain things that they stand for i mean then of course you've got not just the parades but you've got the also the mardi gras indians that i have no experience with um yeah but that's a whole other cultural group that partake in mardi gras uh yep. there's the um just the drinks of mardi gras the foods of mardi gras then uh the the balls, which I, I've been to a couple in Mobile, which is not my thing either. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so I can't really speak of the Louisiana version or the New Orleans versions of those. But just to, to from a standpoint of letting people know that oftentimes what they see in the media is just a small percentage of what it, what the whole uh, carnival season is. Um, and the fact of Mardi Gras is a day and the rest of it is carnival season. Right. Leading up to it. And then as you alluded to, King Cakes and the Feast of the Epiphany and and all the other uh, traditions yep. that probably you and I haven't even touched on. So what did you, you, you made a pretty, I mean, I was looking at your Facebook post. I'm like, I, I was impressed. I was actually really impressed with the level of, I mean, in addition to what you had done that was the the roast beef debris was for your in laws that was christmas eve yeah. right okay yeah so the other the christmas day was we only had a i say only we we had a small part it was a, a community effort between my mom and uh my sister elizabeth's family and and us <clears throat> and so christmas eve uh for the last i don't know 20 plus years it's just try to make it easier on my in-laws, have everybody come to our house, which makes it easier on us selfishly sure. too, Sure. Uh, after the fact. Uh, so we, it's actually been fairly interesting that over the last 20 something years, she's wanted to do mostly uh, Cajun Creole dishes that, um, that I'll, and so I'll end up cooking, you know, 50, 50% of the stuff or so um, this year, because we did kind of midday, we just went with the uh, roast beef po' boys, debris po' boys. Right. 
and um, and thankfully I can find Leidenheimer's little Frenchies bread. Oh, you can get here. them there. Yeah, nice. So yeah, so that or I could have had Risen's French bread, po- uh, you know, mm-hmm. long loaf for the po' boys. Right. <clears throat> Basically, I took three chuck roast, and they were total about ten pounds, and put it in a Dutch oven with beef stock and various seasonings, and I mean. It's, Carrots and onions and celery and cooked right. it in the oven for for season. Cooked it in the oven for three and a half hours. Right. In fact, when you and I got off the last podcast, I think it was three and a half hours in, and I took it out, and it was just perfect because it was it was falling apart and tender. So we did that, and she made some macaroni and cheese. Uh, my mom's recipe: uh, baked macaroni and cheese. And of course, we had a bunch of we had well some hors d'oeuvres and a lot of uh, well we had the biscotti mix actually. Oh yeah, dip. yeah. So um, I'll tend to if I find a recipe in a book, I will tend to find three recipes in three different books. Right. And I will look and compare them. And anyway, I took that and I looked at two or three other people who seem to have legitimate blog postings on this uh, on Po Boy. Uh, creations from New Orleans, and that's kind of what I assembled into <clears throat> the recipe that I used. And then uh, the next day, we ended up went to my mom's, and that's where I had the the Melitton casserole that you showed earlier. Yep. Um, or if you have to cut and paste it, uh, that you can show again. <laughs> well, I have I have this. This looks like yeah. So that was the final. So that's, that's spinach Christmas. Madeline. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's Christmas spinach. day at my mom's. Yeah. Yeah. She's got that nice china. Um, <laughs> so that's pork roast up at the top left. Yep. And then there's rice and gravy. Um, and then to the, the bottom right is your spinach Madeline. And then to the left is the Malitaw, crab shrimp and Malitaw casserole. Uh, and, um, and then we had a good. Caesar salad before that. Uh, so we, we're trying to be good and get some veggies in there. Well, I mean, the spinach madeleine, that's, that's veggies, right? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. That, that, <laughs> yeah, the spinach and the melaton are veggies. All right. But, um, you know, but you got a mixture of pork and seafood on the plate there. Um, yeah. You know, so, and that, that in and of itself, because I'm sure when you share what, what y'all made, um, when you think of the New Orleans uh, Christmas Get togethers and dinners, uh, they can range from anything that's informal to just uh, the getting together and picking on kind of a buffet. So there was enough of us around that we could sit around one big table together and um, have a, just a big pork roast and 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 those uh, casseroles as yep. sides. Yeah, and um, you know families all, all have their different traditions of what they will cook for Christmas. The uh, the Melitaw, as we've talked about before, you'll oftentimes find that on the Thanksgiving table, uh, maybe more so than Christmas, but a lot of people still put it on the Christmas table. The, so, so roast beef was Christmas Eve, and then this dish that I just put up, that was Christmas Day at your mom's. Yeah. And did you, did so? Who made the spinach madeleine? Uh, actually, my niece did. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. You know, you can adjust that dish, and, and that's one of the things that. A lot of the, the famous, I, I, when I only say famous, only because of the fact that certain people take recipes as being etched in stone, is that a lot of the, the well-known chefs even say, you know, use a recipe as a guidepost, as a, right. know, as a roadmap. It does not have to be, if you cannot get the exact ingredients or you don't like something, then you can adjust it to your liking. And so right. if you don't like the spinach madeleine recipe because you find it too hot... You know, make a simple adjustment and either do do a blend of hot and mild or just do a blend of just use regular Velveeta yeah. or another cheese. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we ended up doing <laughs> – well, I mean, we ended up I, – so I did – this is almost like a recap of five shows in, in one morning. Um, I did <laughs> – I did beignets in the morning. Okay. And turkey, sausage, boudin, gumbo. Okay. But then I also bought the okra gumbo 
and then we put shrimp inside there. It all turned out really well. The okra gumbo base is is definitely different than the uh, ch- uh, turkey sausage, chicken sausage, whatever you're you're doing with it. The general consensus was most people preferred the turkey sausage. Uh, so I, you know, for me, I could eat both of them, but yeah, you know, this this is when you're when you're dealing with a whole family. You kind of yeah. have to pick that median point and stick with it. And then I did pralines for kind of dessert-ish type thing. And mm-hmm. Rico got, um, she got a cheesecake, one of those multi-sampler yeah. cheesecakes. It's got like all the different kinds of cheesecakes in one. She got one of those. Kids devoured that. And um, yeah, so it, it was a, it was definitely the first time that we had ever done anything like that for Christmas. And part of the reason why I felt comfortable doing that was because we had done it already in the episodes. So I knew I wasn't going to screw it up because I, you know, and my wife was like, man, you still got it with the beignets. And I, (laughs) I I never really thought of it as a, as as an art form, but to get them right. I mean, Mm-hmm. I, truth be told, I tossed several because I didn't like the way they turned out. They were, they were either on their way to being pita bread or already pita bread. They just didn't pu- puff up, and and yeah. I attributed that exactly what I put in my videos. Like if your temperature drops too far below uh, yeah. three seventy, you're going to not see those poof up. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I've gained uh, be- because of this podcast. I've actually gained a better sense or, or more confidence in my ability mm-hmm. to make authentic stuff. Now that said, yeah. using mixes while mm-hmm. is just fine, you know, getting into the, the, like, I, I really want to go to the boucherie so I can sit there and make boudin with my hands. I, you know, I want to yeah. see that whole process. Uh, because one thing to buy a frozen package in the store yeah. But it's a whole nother thing when, you know, your hands touch that and you made it, you know, and you, and you know that because you've been to them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, and, and I mean, and it's gotta be a lot of the same things like when you had the brewery and you were making certain beers and stuff. I mean, you could go, I'm sure you could go buy things that were as tasty, uh, yeah. as in the same flavor profile. But I mean, to, to know what it took to go into it and not just the, not just the final product, because I'm sure for for every good gallon of, of beer that came out, there was probably a lot of them in the beginning that you had to toss because they, were they weren't horrible. just right. Horrible. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Horrible. And so, um, and, and, and that's the thing is, uh, so yeah, these mixes, you know, and I think I've changed my mind somewhat too, because in some ways I might have said, let's say 10 years ago that, yeah, that's you're, you're you're kind of cheating. You're already halfway there. Right. But the thing about it is, is that um, unless it is a complete finished product that all you're doing is warming up, um, you still have the ability to adjust the the flavor, and either and even the ones that you warm up, you can screw it up if you heat it too hot or right. or burn it. Um, the more practice you have in learning about that, because, you know, so just with beignets and, and for an example uh, mm-hmm. that you touched on was, let's say you want to get really good at making beignets. Well, part of it is let's focus just on the, the uh, execution of the frying, right? You know, Cause as you demonstrated there, that's a very important part. It's much better to have a mix that you're only adding water to. Yeah. And, and your time and get that down Versus buying yeast and buying flour and buying uh, vanilla or whatever else goes into it. I can't remember now. And and then it has to, you mix it and then you got to let it rise and then you got to mix it again or, or whatever called knead it and yep. then flatten it and cut it. And you're looking at two or three hours for that part before you even fry in it. Yep. Um, so to me, if you're wanting to learn to cook these things, and I think most people, 
aren't going to be making, well, they certainly won't be making the amount of beignets that you made when you had your restaurant. In the pot that we're using, the same one that's in the video, you can only fit three at a time anyway. So, you know, it's, it was, you know, it's like, okay, this is yours. And then they get started eating and then this is yours because you don't want them sitting around. You know, I didn't have like a little, you know, cloth and basket and keep them warm. And even then you don't really want to do that. So, so, but like I said, in reality, when you're doing that in that quantity, um, you're probably going to do that maybe once, maybe twice a year. So that, that other aspect of it is that, um, you know, the, the cooking is much more than just having the right recipe is knowing the techniques and knowing what the things should smell like before, while they're cooking, it yep. tastes like, and these mixes, you know, like I said, you can have our data points to say, Hey, this can be very good. And right. then if you trust us and you try it yourself and then you understand, okay, this is what it should taste like. Right. There's so many more things that I know we're going to explore in 2024 with different recipes or different mixes that, and, and we've been very fortunate that, you know, that uh, we've had good ones. And like you said, and, and even making a scratch chicken or, or turkey and undui gumbo versus a seafood, some people just don't like the seafood gumbos. Some people don't like the turkey gumbos. Right. I mean, they're not just, they, you know, they're, they're unique in and of themselves. Yes. And so... Um, you know, if I had a choice, I'd probably always go more toward the, the chicken and the dewey just because I kind of like that a little bit more. But every so often, I want a good seafood one, too. Sure. Yeah, I think the, the seafood is it, the, the biggest thing for me is, is missing lump crab meat, you know, and crab claws in the seafood yeah. gumbo. You know, those kinds of things is, to me, what makes seafood gumbo yeah. authentic and when you have to pay 10 times the mix price just yeah. to get a protein to put in there. So, okay. That, you, you know, I, you know, I have my own thoughts about where I want to see things mm -hmm. go. And, you know, it doesn't involve world domination or anything like that, <laughs> but, but um, obviously I would, I would, there's a lot of things that I want to do, and um, a large part of that is going to be dictated by um, time available, resources available, all that fun mm -hmm. stuff. You know, I, I definitely do want to produce content that I think is informative, for lack of a better term, valuable to some people. And at the same time, the thing that I, I don't want to be known as, but it is critical and a critical component in what we're trying to do is is be a cooking show you know that's yeah. we've been focusing on it because it, you know it's at least for me it's kind of a way to get our feet wet and oh, yeah. uh, and you know you 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 and I both share a a passion for food and so mm -hmm. it it makes sense for us to naturally go after the low hanging fruit which is been the mixes and I'd like to do more interviews. I'd like to get more people on because I think yeah. that that's, that's valuable for other people <clears throat> to see. Like, um, mm -hmm. like you were talking about Nancy and, and Poppy. And, yeah. yeah and I think that's a good, uh, I agree with you from that standpoint, it would be great to have, uh, make more connections and talk to these folks, um, folks that you and I can brainstorm up with. Yep. And, you know, we've got a couple that we've already hit up and I got a few more that I'm hoping to in the next day or two, at least send them a message to just gauge their interest in, in participating. Um, I think that, you know, I think we can easily come up with a list of 50, I'll say 52 people that we could uh, be willing to uh, be interested in having, you know, a conversation with and, uh, if we get a 10th of those, well, hopefully get more than that, but if we get at least a 10th of those, you know, that'll be, you know, make some, some good, uh, diff uh, not differences, but it'll break up the shows in such a way that it'll, it'll be not just you and I talking, but they'll bring, bring other concepts and thoughts for things right. for us to explore further. Yep. And, um, 
And two, the other thing I think with a lot of folks is that, you know, no may not mean, uh, you know, no forever on talking. It may just mean no right now because, hey, I got to plan a bunch of stuff for Mardi Gras. But you know what? During the Lenten season, I might be good. So that's the kind of right. thing that I think that uh, hopefully we can hone people, uh, not hone, hone our message down or our request down to a point where we can say, hey, uh, you know, would you be interested? And if so, if not right now, then when? And then plus, if anybody has any suggestions or thoughts of who they would like to hear from, too, let us Absolutely. know that, too. So. Absolutely. And I, that's, that is a critical component for me. Uh, I want to get, obviously, more people um, involved in the, the, the shows. And uh, part of that is engagement. The other part is, like, what I've seen happen with a lot of the podcasts that I watch on a live basis is that the chat room will complement and sometimes go off on its own tangent. You know, people yeah. kind of checking in with each other and whole communities are built around the fact that a podcast is live. I, you know, I would definitely like to see more people getting involved and I'm not really sure how that goes. Um, you know, obviously, the the more promotion we do, the more people mm -hmm. are going to be prone to tune in for the main show. I mean, we're when I say right. on it, meaning we don't have to be active. We can be sitting there participating in the chat because the chat right. system is running. Mm -hmm. But um, then after the show's over, it cuts to our video of us, you know, kind of sitting mm -hmm. down and taking live questions from people. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that idea because um, like the forum I was talking about earlier, Yeah, uh, you know, it, it got to the point where there was times, even though it wasn't live, like you can see when somebody's on Facebook or Instagram, well, I guess, I'm not sure as much on Instagram, but on Facebook when you got the little green dot or something showing that somebody is, is present, um, that you, you could have that conversation where – I think about something on a gardening subject or a history subject, you know, I write a couple of paragraphs about it, just the, my, me being inquisitive. And because it was usually an evening and a lot of these people were sitting around, they'd, they'd respond. And so you had that, that conversation. And so yeah. <clears throat> I could see that being something similar growing into that. And I, I mean, you can even, we could find the term and name it after that, for that matter. Uh, you know, if we want to call it a certain session like that, where hopefully people would want to come in and, and, you know, have suggestions or share their experiences or, you know, or such. And especially if we do have an interviewee, interviewer, yeah, interviewee, someone we interview that um, they could maybe, if they have the time, it'd be great if they could come back and participate during that same segment too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that would almost be a given, you know, that would yeah. be, something where that's the whole point of you tuning in is that you get to watch the premiere of that show and yeah. then interact with us afterwards. And, you know, we can talk about how the show came to be. Now it's not going to be a feature length movie. It's basically going to be no. the episode <laughs> and then the episode follow up. And I think it's good because of the fact that you and I have on a subject, for example, we have our own particular curiosities and interest about it right um you know what we've collectively researched or had life experiences with i'd like to try that for a while and see what see how that goes i think that could be very successful and i know the, yeah. the folks at bayou wild have um yeah. have that that uh have already done that but mm -hmm. um you know leveraging their work and yeah. and being able to work together with them, it'd be great to be able to be kind of complementary to them. You know, we kind yeah. of feed off of each other. And if they're willing to do that, I I would love because they've they've got the well, their their boots on the ground in Louisiana already. Oh yeah, and I think the other thing when you were talking about that earlier, uh, you know, referencing them, I mean, you know, we're, I mean, I'll speak for myself, <laughs> not really outdoorsmen from that standpoint. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 when I was younger, when my dad was around and we would go fishing, but even then it was maybe three, you know, I might go four times in a year, 
but I was more along, you know, it was, it was a spending the time and, and enjoying the fishing. Right. But it's not to the point like, like I'm with Meliton where, you know, Hey man, you know, so-and-so's catching this here and this is the technique I got to use and, you know, got to be this kind of boat and okay, I'm watching the moon and the stars and the, and all this other stuff Right. where that is still very interesting. And I think you and I enjoy that learning about it, even participating in it, but, you know, having those other people as guides who are specialty, not guides in, in the sense of a fishing guide, but guides in the sense of this is their world that they encompass and they touch a little bit of it and they're learning too, you know. So I think, yeah, that that's definitely them with certain things, you know, then you'll have certain other people who are going to have other specialties. And then there's got to be a whole like a uh, art scenes and music. I mean, music's another thing yeah. we hardly ever have, haven't touched on. Yeah, and I've got those gals that do the intro song for the uh, for the show. Um, mm-hmm. They're they've like I said, I think I told you they offered to come here and, and play live yeah. for us, uh, which I think would be amazing. Um, yeah. But at the same time, uh, we've got to coordinate all that. But yeah, I think that would be definitely a uh, you know something that can be done. Well, anyway, I mean, I think we've got I think we've got. Uh, Certainly some great opportunities for, you know, we've got obviously Lent and its historical yeah. impact on the city, the the Catholic mm-hmm. Church in general, regardless of whether or not you're religious, the impact that it's had culturally on the city oh, is, yeah. is significant. And, um, of course, uh, Jazz Fest. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's something, you know, we've got crop, what? Crawfish season is supposed to start up pretty soon here, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much in uh, February, I think, is really when you start seeing them. And then, because um, everybody's going to want to do it. Because, I mean, you see the same posting I see on Facebook where yeah. people come in visiting New Orleans in the middle of, like, November. Where's the yeah. best crawfish? And everybody's got to tell them, you can't get, you can't get live uh, boiled crawfish now. And But, you know, if you go to a reputable restaurant or yep. food purveyor in the city, yep. uh, they'll tell you, look, I'm not going to sell you that crap from China. China, yeah. Um, because I'm going to sell you either locally caught or uh, what are the, what's the term for sourcing? Locally sourced yeah. uh, You know, items. And uh, if they'll sell you something else, and I understand, and you know better than I do because of the cost of, of putting together items on a menu, um, sometimes you have to go with, uh, to include something, you may have to go with a substitute or, or make. So, um, but I think that, you know, like you talk about Lent you know, there's a whole thing on, I mean, it could be some, well, maybe in, at the, uh, all saints day type, you know, but there's a whole thing of cemeteries and, and right. practices right. of that, uh, architectural architecturally from, you know, there's those type of things that. You've gotten, um, you know, the state has its seasons, the regions have its seasons, right? And um, I mean, we can do a whole show on hurricanes. Oh <laughs> so yeah, but yeah. I know that one of the things I'm trying to get done is for the on, on our, and it's more particular to our Hubble ancestry about our great grandfather being killed in that cyclone or tornado yep. in Vashery. This is the hunt next year. The 2024 is 100 years since it happened. Yeah. So I've been trying to get. Uh, with people who are still there and relatives who are interested trying to do a commemorative mass on the hundredth anniversary, as well as get a, uh, a roadside marker put up there probably from March on. I'm going to probably really ramp some of that up, which, right. uh, right. You know, hopefully we can compliment and talk about some of that with, uh, and as I come across things, maybe that can even add to the conversation that we have week to week. The, the biggest thing for me is going to be trying to, uh, at least from the podcast perspective, is is going to be trying to interject the that you have the festival or you have the event that's going on. Why? How did it originate? What's the point of it? What to expect yeah. if you go? All those things. Um, I. I think, and then obviously, if there's a food component to it, great. Then there's a food component yeah. to it, and then we can interject that. I, I just, uh, I feel like uh, 
Yeah, I just I feel like uh, we we probably could benefit a little bit from you know just diversifying the the what the yes. content of the podcast. We're food centric, and you have very good cooks in right. most families, um, but not everybody is a professional chef or works in a in the food industry to to the extent of being. Um, you know, that, that you know, our life revolves around it somewhat, but at the same time, um, that's only one portion of what we talk about. Uh, sure. So, and, and so I think that the, the podcast is a reflection of that. There's other good pot. You know, heck, we may even talk about other podcasts that we've come across that are complementary to, you know, they may do certain things a certain way. Um, and, you know, either talk to those people as guests or, and learn from them and, share with others because uh you know we can only put out so much <laughs> in a that's in true week to week that's true you know, and if you really want to get your your uh your louisiana education up um outside the classroom type of thing you know it's going to take a lot of different sources uh i'm amused by the types of things that we when i say we my wife and i and and in some aspects the, the whole family what we are willing to sit behind the TV and watch on YouTube. There is a lot of topics out there yeah. that are interesting, but you have to dip your toe in. Yeah. Be willing to dip your toe in. And YouTube is great at throwing content your way that it thinks you might be interested in. And mm -hmm. it does incredibly well when it picks up on your habits and then starts recommending yeah. similar types of, of uh, content. The, the, the point being is that we, we don't know what is going to hit necessarily. You know, we have yeah. a sense, but one of the things that I, I want to always leave on the table is... You know, maybe, maybe, the, well, this thing will evolve. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. as it already has in the seven short months that it's been around, it's slowly yeah. evolved. And because we don't have any network to cancel us, <laughs> we can, yeah. uh, we can keep banging our heads against the wall trying to figure out what's going to click with people. Yeah. And that's great. I mean, we'll just, we'll, we'll get there. We're not afraid to be on camera. So I'm not worried about, yeah. That I'm not worried about any of the technicalities of doing this. This is yeah. pretty straightforward now at this point. But the things that are going to get interesting for us is finding topics that, well, a they got to be interesting to us because yeah. if they're not, we're I mean we're not going to try and no fake our ways it. through it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, th there <laughs> there's certain things. It's like. Yeah, go start your own YouTube channel for that, you know? Yeah. Um, but the when you're developing these shows, you're you're doing it because you want to build content that interests other people. And truth be told, you really don't know what's gonna interest other people until you start throwing it out there. I mean, yeah, I mean if you're a professional YouTuber, you you probably say, Well, this will absolutely work and this will absolutely not work, but everything in between is kind of hit or miss. It'll be interesting to see how this all kind of fleshes out in its first full year uh, yeah. of existence. Um, the I, I really do have high hopes for it, and it's going to grow and evolve. And, you know, obviously I, I started working on, like, let's see, I was working on some of the graphics like that and, yeah. you know, starting to rebrand a little bit and... Uh, you know, just go with uh, a slightly different look, and then probably what will happen is we'll have uh, a much shorter intro. As much as I love that intro, um, and I took a lot of time putting that together, you know, sometimes you got to cut things loose that don't make a lot of yeah. sense for you. And you did a great job on that intro. And I mean, it's, and I can understand, like I said, you're proud of it because you put some time and effort and thoughtfulness into it. Yeah. And, um, because it's trying to give a sense to the viewer of what you want 
the show to be about and, exactly. and what you are about. Getting to the point of the of the meat is you know maybe where YouTube viewers tend to gravitate towards. So I think putting the the intro out there where people can watch it separately is a good idea. Yeah, uh, and then and hopefully, I think as YouTube viewing, uh, I don't know if it evolves, but it becomes more of a a normal thing, which maybe it's leaning toward having that represent what the channel is, is probably the appropriate place to have it. And, yeah. and then they can pick and choose what they want to watch. You know, yeah. as we broaden out in 2024 into other areas, um, we have to do it in such a way that keeps people engaged because you and yeah. I can get behind food all day long. If you talk about praline, and so the big essential ingredient to pralines was sugar. And so, well, sugar came from the sugar plantations and sugar right. came upriver. So, you know, so as you as you keep drilling back on that, then all of a sudden you have the agricultural aspects of what makes a good sugarcane harvest. What, what you know, what are the unique, you know, are all sugar canes the same? Right. And then, you know, what type of uh, resources are applied to it? And then, of course, you go back to the history, which uh, is some of it's not very uh, favorable uh, for, you know, enslavement reasons, but sure. then you have the, the plantation homes, but then you have that in and of itself, a whole other touristy industry of, uh, you know, the architecture and the way people lived in those days. And then you have, um, you know, just the, the commerce associated with, with sugar and the demand and, and, you know, and then even the health aspects of what it does to Louisiana health. So, I mean, you can start from one point, and I mean, there's all these different things that either feed in or, or tangents of it. Um, yeah. And so I, I think hopefully what that does for people is understand and appreciate that just because you hold a praline in your hand, what, what does it take and, and what's the history behind it? And sure. it's some of it's the recipe, but some of it's the resources. And then, yeah. you know, so I think that part of the, at the end is you want people to be thinking and thoughtful and um, not just viewing things on the surface of Correct. what they are, but there's... You know, like I said one time, John Foles was telling me, you know, that the thing behind a recipe is it's not just the recipe, it's the story. Sure. And I think that's the things we're exploring is the stories behind whether it's a, a food or it's a uh, cultural custom. It's a historical context. I mean, you, when you yeah. think about it, pretty much everything in, well, history in general, but in Louisiana history has a a reason why it came into being and that thing where we played phil um yeah. what, do i still have it here dude get in that make some proline it's like a hurt your manhood right <laughs> 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 so you know you know and he's the kind of guy i can relate to because he's you know he's he's the down-to-earth kind of guy but he's also west monroe i don't know anything yeah. about anything north of i-10 i'm not really you know, unless you're going to the North Shore, you yeah. know, but but basically Baton Rouge North, for, I just I don't have any historical context. And and I would love I would love to explore that because I know there's more to the state than what we grew up with. And, um, you know, the 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 Natchitoches meat pies, those kinds of things. Where did those come from? Why yeah. are they popular there? Yeah. Why aren't they pop yeah. as popular in New Orleans? Those kinds of things. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, there's, uh, you know, I got I got a lot of ideas. You know, I I think mm -hmm. a lot of it's going to kind of come together. But I I really do enjoy the like if you had to uh, okay, well here here's one, and this is something that's sound biteable. Um, if you had to pick the episodes that we've done together till this point, what mm -hmm. would you say is your favorite? Now, what defines favorite can be totally up to you, but what would be your favorite? I'm trying to think because, I mean, I've enjoyed them all. I, I was trying to think of whether it would be the gumbo from the surprise factor of of trying the product. Mm -hmm. Although, I've got to say that I learned a lot of technique from you with the beignets and even the pralines because of some of the stuff that how mine didn't turn out. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. What, what's yours? The one episode I enjoyed the most was the the olive salad episode. 
and we I think we did yeah. two, right? We yeah, did, we did the, two we, that. we did the basic, or not the basic, but the original brand, and then mm-hmm. we did the crew brand. And the reason why I like this because it opened my eyes, uh, and I really yeah. wish we would have gotten those guys in for an yeah. interview, and it just didn't pan out. But maybe at some point down the road we'll get them on. But I would think from a, from an educational standpoint, the olive salad episodes were my favorite. Um, yeah. I I want to do more interview episodes though because I think I, yeah. I think I can learn a lot from those interviews that mm-hmm. help educate me and help yeah. maybe drive further the discussions down the road uh, for future episodes. Um, yeah, and I, you know, circling back to those two uh, Olive Salad episodes, um, I mean, I, I, like I said, I really enjoyed all of them. And, uh, you know, and uh, like talking about learning the techniques from you on the beignets and the, and the pralines, mm-hmm. the surprising, like I said, there was, a, I guess everything, there's been a certain amount of surprise. Uh, the gumbo, I think I just was not expecting it to be as good as it turned out to be just sure. because it was so simple. I never have bought those on my own just because I'd like, oh, man, it's too hot or that's right. too such and such. But yet um, incorporating them into this dip, like I said, I've and I mean, and I'm going to make it again when my brother gets here. I mean, this, that'll be the fifth time that I've made that that dip with one of the <laughs> and different. How much? How uh, much would you have olive salad in a given year prior to yeah, that? Yeah, just uh, uh, maybe a cup uh, <laughs> right. in uh, in once a year. Right. Um, and so uh, when my brother gets here, I'm gonna hit hit them with the um, ghost pepper one because with all those boys, you know, they're gonna be they want to try to. You know, man, show the manhood and, and yeah. all that with the hot. <laughs> they're gonna be like, well, actually, you know what? The the chipo- the uh, ghost pepper is really not bad uh, when you no. pair it up with the dairy from the cream cheese. It's 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 actually yeah. quite tolerable. Um, and yeah. that reminds me, I think uh, I bought cream cheese for the holidays, and I never made a dip. And I think I'm going to do that this afternoon after we get done yeah. here. Because we're talking about things that I enjoy talking about, and I think you enjoy talking about mm-hmm. that, you know, it's definitely part of the highlight for the week is to, to get together and talk to you and, and then try these different things, even if we haven't put as much uh, deep thought into what we're going to cover this particular episode, uh, as far as what we're going to say, you know, there's still so much out there. And I'm hoping that the standpoint of people, especially during this holiday break, because I know that the the prowling episode seemed to have got quite a few. Did it yeah. break? Or it should have already broken a hundred as views, hasn't it? And I mean, it's not that I'm what we're watching it from the standpoint of it does give us some sort of in, idea of what folks might be interested in, which is like I said, in in I have done some some of the independent quick product videos just to document it, and I'll do that on my page. And what's interesting is that, like, I think the gumbo one has only gotten maybe 30-something views on my page of the, the the one I did of just making the gumbo. Yeah. The praline one, I can't remember if it was praline or the beignets. One of them was, I think, the beignets. That was way over, like, 150 or so wow. in, a, in a short time. And so, like I said, I, I look forward to learning, to tasting. Um, and even if we don't do, you know, there's like we did the ones on the books uh in, in my my cookbook collection yeah. um that's just more information to share with people on on where to get these things and and what we use for resources you know so i think that there's a i think that we still got several years of good material that we can come up with and hopefully oh sure a year from now when we come we're talking about uh what we did in 2024 you know we'll be interested to see how it evolves all right. Well, I mean, uh, I, I think we'll just go ahead and, and wrap it there. We have uh, two and a half hours of material that I have to sift through now yeah. and find the, the nuggets and probably condense it down into 20 minutes or so. Um, well, I, I, I hope to, um, like I said, I've been I've got some ideas of some folks on my uh, that I've been meaning to put down on, on a list for interviews. Yeah. Uh, you know, two or three I've reached out to and. You know, I know we've got one we probably need to, if you hadn't, uh, one of us needs to probably reach back out to make sure he's still on track yeah. for the new year. Yes. And then, um, I, like I said, I've, I've got a few more that 
that I may just reach out to. And then uh, if they come back and they're positive, then I'll let you know, Hey, by the way, <laughs> so-and-so might be interested in talking if you're interested in that. Uh, but I think you, you would be from the standpoint of, like I said, you never know. I mean, heck, I may see something on, and you too, uh, you see somebody on Facebook that would be an interesting pull in a diverse crowd and educate people and um, and see where we end up next year. I certainly hope so. I I, I have <laughs> high hopes. I really do. I, did too. Um, I just, I, I guess what I just have to figure out is um, how do we, how do we make this, how do we keep this fun? How do we keep it engaging both for ourselves and for the audience? And that, that's really what this is all about. And, and I mean, it's been great. It's been absolutely wonderful to get, to get to know you again. I mean, that's, yeah, you too. Yeah. yeah it's, I it's, agree. it's crazy <laughs> that, uh, you know, we've been separated for decades and, we're we're coming back together and and how much we actually have in common <laughs> it's kind yeah, of yeah. it's kind of you know beyond being family just the the kinds yeah. of things that we share appreciations for so yeah, yeah. you know i i have a lot of personal goals i want to set for 2024 i do i definitely want to yeah. get more into videography more into editing um uh, i'm i've really started to get that down and uh aerial photography is another one that i'm really yeah. big at uh learning more of and not really for business purposes but um I, if it helps business that's great but it's yeah. more of a just kind of self uh edification you know just yeah. just really understanding the tools that are available and i don't know why maybe this is going to be my hobby heading into my later years i have no idea but um there's there's enough of us that exist that were in technology in the late eighties, mid to late eighties, who have survived um, all of the ebbs and flows of the industry. Yeah. And now uh, a lot of us find ourselves doing exactly what I'm doing right now, which is what we're hopping online. So there's a yeah. lot of, there's a lot of gray hair goatees around, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I just found it comical that we were, <laughs> We were followed a lot by 18 to 34 year olds. I'm going, okay, yeah. that's interesting, <laughs> but I'm not doing any TikTok on here. Just so you yeah, know, yeah. ain't happening. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to see me dance. No, or or do any kind of like jackass type stuff, you know, like, yeah, I don't no. know if you ever saw that show, but. Uh, yeah, I've no. seen it. Hell, I, I get sore just bending down to pick a <laughs> cookie off the floor. <laughs> <I'm not> gonna... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I sympathize. All right, man. Well, uh, right. tell the family, uh, and of course to you too, uh, Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy and, New Year. And um, really looking forward to 2024, doing stuff with you. I think it's going to be a lot yeah, of fun. I do too. Um, uh, the adventure continues. The adventure continues. <laughs> All right, man. Take All care. Right. Take care. Bye. All right. See you.